it's springtime, I'm not fine. Let the rain come washing over. Into this summer, I remember the years of watching flowers. Back when I thought I belonged, those years are gone. It's the season, the words I don't hear. It's the season, the words I don't fall apart. Through the fire and pain we await with the joy you made. Oh, autumn, you never let down. Call me off the boat and on to the waves that tied you up and I turned away as they made you bleed. That's just who you are. You showed me how to see and 
taught me how to speak But I still spit in your face But you still chase me Hey, good morning and welcome to Action Church. We're so glad you're here with us on the, the live stream. My name is Mitch and, um, you know, we have this live stream up on Facebook Live every week. This morning we had to scramble because we had some connectivity issues. I know you're surprised. That never happens around here. Um, we also are live on live.actionchurch.com and you can catch the rebroadcast, if you will, on YouTube. You can catch it on the podcast apps, wherever you get podcasts, you can also get it on our app. There's video and audio versions of it on there. So, 
lots of ways for you to participate in what's going on here at Action Church. Um, so this morning is a little bit different if you're in this room because there's a couple extra people on hand. Are we reopen? No, we are not reopen. We are talking about how do we safely reopen Action Church. And the thing I took away from this morning that I just found really cool is it is really obvious that everybody at Action Church wants to take care of everybody else at Action Church. And that was really cool. It was also cool to see all the talents coming out, people who make masks, people who have access to foggers, people who operate foggers, and all this cool stuff. We also have some people here who are immunocompromised or whatever fancy words you want to call it. They're at-risk people, and they still showed up because they have something to give now, that's not in any way to guilt trip you if you're not here. I want to be very clear on that. <laughs> we do not want people showing up if they don't feel comfortable being here. And that's why we're doing this live stream. And we're trying to get really good at it. I know we have some room for improvement, but we're trying. I promise. Um, so, all of that to say, next week, 930, if you think you have something to give and you're comfortable showing up, you are welcome. We have lots of room to spread out. Everybody's wearing masks. I had to take mine off just to come up here, so we're being very safe. Um, as always at Action Church, invite, invest, and get involved. Inviting's never been easier. All you have to do is share this online with somebody. Um, investing, still just as easy. You can give online through the app, through the website, and getting involved. Although you might not be able to get involved other than our 930 powwows, I would encourage you just to get involved in your community, to do the Action Church thing, and to take action with those around you. So, all of that said, let's get this rolling. Don. Well, hey, good morning. Um, I feel good about myself because I remember that it's Memorial Day, and, and I know the difference, but I always call Memorial Day Labor Day and Labor Day Memorial Day, but I know... It's Memorial Day, and I can't think of, like, a more fitting weekend to talk about what we're going to talk about, um, because this is the weekend where we celebrate and remember the bravest among us, the people who actually gave their life in wartime, um, and this used to be called Decoration Day into the 1800s, where they would decorate the graves of the fallen dead, but now it's Memorial Day because we remember not only, you know, their graves, but we remember their lives and what they did. And so, but it's a good reminder for us, all of us, we've been talking about being brave and getting braver, um, that being brave is, it's, it's dangerous business. It's, it's impossible to sort of demonstrate bravery without overcoming your fears and not just your fears, but generally some sort of danger. Um, now, the interesting thing, I think, about the God of the Bible is the Bible's made up, it's not really, we say it's made up of books. It's really not made of books. It's letters and poetry, and uh, it's like a bookshelf more than a book, I would say that. But, but the interesting thing is you would think, well, it would be very disjointed or it would be very different. And there's many different and thousands of years take place inside the Bible. But the one sort of constant I've noticed is that the God of the Bible just seems to show up over and over and over and encourage people into acts of bravery. I mean, any sort of Bible story you can think of, even the big ones you learned in, in Sunday school or if you were a church kid, think of Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons. Not really. He didn't have that many sons. That's just the way the song went. But Father Abraham was urged to be brave, to move out of his mom's basement and move across the country into this unknown land. And then, of course, Moses is urged by a burning bush, the, the voice of God, to go back into a land where he's facing a murder warrant and take the king on, take the pharaoh on head to head and lead his people out of slavery. And the story goes on. You know, David is urged by God to, to you know, go against a giant when he's a young, young man. And, and every story, if you think about it in the Bible, even New Testament and not just men, Deborah, the prophetess, you know, is urged by God and empowered by God to be brave. She takes on the commander of the army with a tent spike and it gets ugly and a hammer. Imagine where that goes and his ear. Oh, I've given away the secret of that story. But, but it's like so amazing. Mary, 
young Mary, the mother of Jesus, is urged. You know, like you're what the child within you is of the Holy Spirit. It's 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 the Son of God, and you know her husband Joseph going, hey, you've got to be brave. You've got to you've got to face the angry mob because you're going to take this young pregnant fiance and you know the baby's not yours but you're going to take her as your wife and so again and again and again in the story we could go through all the stories of the apostles who started out as commercial fishermen or tax collectors or or other small businessmen usually or one was a zealot he was a fighter he was a militia member and they were urged by their creator to acts of bravery and it's one of the few constants and so even though maybe bravery doesn't make <laughs> make a lot of sense in the idea of evolution because you would think like, hmm, that would be something that would select out of the system. You know, the, the non-brave would actually survive and the brave generally wouldn't survive. So it doesn't make sense in the evolution you learned about in high school, but it certainly shows in the Bible that there's an evolution of bravery. That bravery isn't just sort of like red pill, blue pill that you take and all of a sudden you're brave. It's something, it's a step-by-step -step evolution. And I'm not going to read all of the scriptures today because we're three weeks into this or four weeks into this, my goodness. Um, but I just want to remind you of the evolution of Gideon. It started out, Gideon, we meet him, and he's sort of, I like to call it the stay in the cave order, but it's like, stay home, stay safe. He's cowering in the cave because there's a group of marauders, there's a group of people that come every year and they jack them for everything they have. So imagine you spend your year sort of, and this is an agricultural society too, um, they come in every year and everything you've planted, everything you've saved up, everything you've got saved up for the winter, they just, they, they just take it by force. And then it says, and there's a detail in there that makes it even more cruel. Like, not only do they, <coughs> excuse me, not only do they take the food that they have and take the livestock they have, they burn everything else down every year. And it's like, man, can you imagine under those circumstances? And all they could do is hide. At least all they thought they could do was hide. Because that's what they were doing, and that's where we might meet Gideon. Gideon is a young man. We find him, he's hiding. He's, it's a, you know, he's threshing grain in a wine press, which means nothing to you and I, but it means he's hiding what little grain he has, and he's doing something really sort of inefficient and uncomfortable so he can just keep what little he has. And so we meet Gideon is hiding, and the angel comes to him and goes, oh, no, you're, you're, you're not a, you know, a hide-in-the-cave guy. You're a mighty hero. And so the angel of God urges Gideon and, and, and tells him, like, you're a hero, you're actually brave, and you're going to change everything. And then we find sort of this, his story evolves. Because here's a guy who's hiding like everyone else. There's no leadership. There's no one saying, hey, we should make a stand. Instead, they're just, the best they can do is just hide in their houses, hide in a cave, hide under a rock, and let the people take everything. And then we find Gideon first little step of bravery. God tells him to destroy the idols of his father. Destroy the family idols. Now, we think about this as like knocking down some rocks or burning, you know, some wood. Much bigger than that. This is actually more about like giving up on lies. Because up to that point, Gideon had been relying on Baal and relying on Asherah to protect him. And guess what? It wasn't working very well. And for, you know, relying on Baal and Asherah to give them luck and crops and rain. You know, like, they're up to that point, he was believing, he was buying in as everyone else is, that this is the way the world works. And this is how the world began. And we trust in Baal and Asherah. And like most false systems, the interesting thing, and you can kind of relate to this today, like what did they do when Baal didn't provide them with crops or Baal didn't protect them from marauders or Asherah didn't bring them rain? The priests of Baal and the priests of Asherah would say to those people, it's your fault. You're not worshiping enough. You're not sacrificing enough. And so Gideon is urged by God to bravely burn down those idols and turn away from the false ideas, and then his neighbors wanted to kill him. Now, the next thing he did and this is where it's sort of the story evolves more and where we pick it up today, um, is where we left off last week is he calls an army. It says this, it says, so Jeroboam, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, which means let Baal take care of himself. I love that. Like his dad was so smart when everyone wanted to kill him for destroying the Baal altar. 
He's like, why do you have to work for Baal? Seems like Baal's a pretty big god. He should destroy Gideon. So I love that. So Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Herod. And the armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Mora. Once again, I always point this out, but these are specific directions. This is not a storybook in story time. They're writing this going, you know where the valley is. That's where they met. And then it says the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let you off to fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they have saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore, tell the people, Whoever is timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 willing to fight. So we know a couple things from this. Interestingly enough, it says that Gideon blew a ram's horn. Don't know why he didn't drive a Chevy. Not a Ford. It was a ram. That's a dad joke. I'm sorry. But we know he was a, he was a Dodge Ram lover. And we also know that people, and, and I love this part about learning about bravery, it's like, there were no warriors <laughs> in Israel before he blew the horn of his Dodge Ram. Like, there are no warriors, and now we have too many warriors, you know, right? I mean, think about that. Like, the change from, like, nobody's willing to fight. Nobody's willing to stand up. They're just getting jacked every year. Like, everything they work for gets taken away from them, and everybody just sort of hides out and says, yes, sir, may I have another? Like, they're not fighting back. But one guy stands up. God inspires one brave young man who was also hiding, don't forget. And now we have too many warriors. I mean, that's where were those guys? I'll tell you where they were. They were waiting for someone to say, let's, let's do this. They didn't want to be the only one. That's suicide. But guess what? If nobody stands up, if nobody gets brave like Gideon did, 22,000 guys showed up. And God says, that's too many. And notice, like, sort of the premium on bravery. God's saying, like, I know, <laughs> you know, like, I know him. Um, he's really nervous, and he came because, like, his older brother came, so let's send him. So, so basically, there's a, there's a principle here, too, of, like, it's, you know, it's great that 22,000 showed up, but he's like, you know, fewer is better in this sense. Like, I'd have a, rather have fewer braver guys. Um <coughs> But, but I want you to sort of just, just don't forget this. And it's so true. Like, we've seen this all over our country. Like, one person will stand up, a nobody, someone you've never heard. No, not a lead. And then all of a sudden, people go, yeah, that's right. And there's such a power. Like, one Gideon willing to fight turns into 10,000 willing to fight. So being brave is contagious. Just like fear is contagious. Just like when people start getting afraid, like, it's so interesting what happens to us as humans. Like we, we become afraid and it's like that is contagious. It ripples through us. Probably, you know, more than the virus in America, fear has certainly been contagious. But also being brave is also contagious. It's spread throughout Israel and it spreads everywhere it goes. It only takes one and they infect others and it's pretty amazing. But this story gets really weird next. Um, it says, then the Lord told Gideon, there are still too many. And... <laughs> And here's why the evolution of bravery is so important and why it's so important that Gideon started sort of obeying God as he went. Because I, it doesn't say anything about Gideon replying back, but Gideon has to be thinking, there are way more than 22,000 guys out there, right? And now we're down to 10,000, and you're telling me 10,000 is too much? You know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm brave, but I'm not stupid. We talked about that last week. So this had to be a bit much. This had to be very difficult. It says, there are still too many. Bring them down to the spring, and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. Then Gideon took his warriors down to the water, and the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. In one group, put all of those who cup water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. Um... And in the other group, all of those who kneel down and drink from their mouths in the stream. And you can imagine, like, Gideon watching this process. He's like, oh, please, please use your hands. Come on, guys. Stop putting your mouth in the water, you idiot. Like, use your hands. Like, that guy's beefy. I want him on my team. But it says only 300 of the men drank from their hands. And all the others got down on their knees and drank from their mouths in the stream. And God says, 
I'll take the 300. This is the original 300. If you ever watched the movie 300, that was years later. But this is the original 300. Like out of 22,000, God says 300. That's the, the <laughs> that's the guys. Now, I've heard a lot of good sermons and a lot of good speculation. You're not going to hear a good sermon. But like good speculation is I've heard people go, you know, the guys who put their mouth in the water, they weren't looking out for the enemy. Um and the guys who put their hand down, they were watching the whole time. Maybe, maybe God's going, those guys are super observant. But it seems like that even being super observant, if the uh, odds are 300 to 50,000, probably not super helpful. Um, I wanted to get you a cat video this morning. Like, I was thinking... It, it, it applies because I have one of my cats who eats like a raccoon. He literally sticks his hand in the dish and grabs um, <laughs> he grabs food and eats it with his hand or paw or whatever. I'm not good with cat anatomy, but he really does. And I thought like, oh, that would be a great example. And so I've tried numerous times this week. Michelle sent me one, but it doesn't fully show him grabbing in his hand. So I was trying to capture that. And because he's a cat, every time I got up and he was doing that at the dish, then he would just look at me. But so you'll have to trust me. I'm not crazy. Like, he really does that, and that has nothing to do with that. It's just cute, right? I'll, I'll, I'll show you later, maybe. But, but this is sort of the jumping the shark moment of the story, if you want to be honest. Like, and you remember, like, you've heard this thing. Do you know this actually comes from Happy Days? The point in Happy Days where they're like, we've done everything else, and now Fonzie is going to water ski and jump over a, ha- <laughs> a shark on his water skis. That's the jump the shark moment. That's the moment when you go, okay, I don't know what's going on here, but we've gone too far. That's sort of this moment in the story, I think. And I don't know why. I, I put this up on the big screen so you could notice how short his shorts are with a jacket on. It's awesome. But that's sort of what's happening in the story. This story is like, okay, I get the fact that we're outnumbered. Like, I know God is writing his story, history. And it's funny because on one hand, like, you go, oh, I get that the best story in this is like one brave guy stands up and then like this plucky little army fights this giant army and they win giving away the ending, sorry. This would be a different story if they were all slaughtered mercilessly. But but I was thinking like, but honestly, 22,000 or 10,000 or 300, like it's kind of pointless at this point. Like they're still outnumbered. It says that the, and we're going to read it again, like it says the camels, which is like the tanks of that time are countless. Like there's, there, there's lots of these invaders because if you notice earlier in the story, and I urge you like read Judges 6, 7, and 8, like I'm not doing it justice, it's really exciting. But it says that this is not just the usual invaders, this is the invaders plus people they had make an alliance with and go, hey, let's go jack the Israelites. You got time? And they're like, yeah, let's go along. And so this is a bigger army than they've ever faced. But God is doing something here. And it's weird because you kind of go, why would God call Gideon And then he goes out with his pickup truck and calls 22,000 people. Like, that's amazing, right? Like, that's a good story. And then God says, nope, too many. (laughs) Anybody who's scared or has an appointment later or, you know, like anybody who has to be at work on Monday, you go home and then there's 10,000. And then God said, nope, too many. Okay, we got another test. I'm going to give you a drink and however you, you know, and it's like get down to 300. You're like, what is God doing here? Like, why not just go destroy the enemy, right? And you and I struggle with this, I think, a lot of times. Like, why does God even call people to be brave? Why call Gideon? Why call 10,000? Why call 22,000? Why call 300? Like, if God can do what God wants to do, like, God could smite them all. So why, why bother? And, and, and it's interesting, and I, I thought about, like, how to describe that. And I think the way to think about it is this. Um, a little question you don't have to answer, but out there in um, streaming land, those of you who are not wearing pants, um, what do these soldiers do? That's the question, right? Like, these little green soldiers. And I, I was looking at them, and I was like, okay, there's a guy with a bazooka and or a stovepipe. There's a guy with a machine gun, a guy with another automatic weapon. 
There's a guy armed only with binoculars, which I feel sort of sorry for. I guess he's a spotter. And then there's a guy with like a ramped rifle and shotgun shells, so he's screwed. Like, I'm just telling you, like, he has the wrong gun for those shells, so he's, the guy in front is, like, what do they do? Here, here's another question. What do these soldiers do? I mean, I guess the queen is technically not a soldier, and the king is technically, but, but what do they do? And the answer is all the same. They don't do anything. They're pieces. They're, they're, they're toys. They're avatars. In a sense, the reason why it doesn't matter if there's 22,000 or 10,000 or 300 is because God is sort of using Gideon and his friends like the monopoly piece. You know, like I'm the hat. I'm the car. Well, if you're the hat, it doesn't mean you wear it. It's tiny. And if you're the car, you don't get to zoom around it. It's just an avatar. It's just a piece. It's just something to go, this is my piece in the game. And that's what God was sort of using Gideon and his friends. Like, literally, God wants to do something here. And he calls Gideon, and he calls his friends, and he's like, I'm going to use you to do something. I need you to be brave. I need you to trust me. Now, that's going to bother some of you because it bothers me at times. You're like, well, am I literally a pawn? Like, why does God need me? And those of us who think about that sometimes think like, well, why should I do something like that? Why should I put myself in danger? Why should I be brave? Why should I stand up if God's going to do what God's going to do? And if you go, well, no, that's not true. God needs Gideon. God, well, yes and no. We should struggle through that because what Jesus said, if you're a Christian this morning, if you're a follower of Christ, Jesus said this, those who love their life in this world will lose it. And those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Those who, you know, think about, like, people who really love their life, who are scared, like, I, I can't lose my life. My life is so precious to me. Like, I've got to do everything possible to keep that life. He's like, they're sort of losing their life, right? And we've seen that. Like, there's a certain point where you try so hard to save your life that you really aren't living. But he said the opposite is true in the same way. That if you're willing to lose your life, like Gideon and his friends were the only people in the, in the you know, area who are like, we'll give up our lives to take on this fight. Like, they're really living. And then if you go, well, that's sort of a stretch, Don. Well, Jesus also said in John 15, he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Like, you're going to do amazing things. This is all part of the plan for apart from me. He said, what? You can do nothing. So it's easy to sort of, if we stopped here, you get the feeling like, oh, God, I don't know, like Gideon's sort of a pawn. God's doing, he's moving him around like the hat in the Monopoly game. And Gideon is just sort of a piece on the game board. Um, but I want you to notice something next. And I want to read this to you because it's so interesting that God absolutely cares about Gideon's state and his feelings in this because he does something next that's really interesting. Because even though he doesn't have to, even though Gideon is being obedient, like, clearly Gideon has evolved into a man of faith because he started out like, okay, I'll knock down the rocks and I'll knock down the tree, but I'm going to do it at night because I'm scared, to, you know, going out and calling an army. And then God said, oh, by the way, <laughs> send 95, 98% of your army home. And he just does it. But it says this. It says the Midianite camp was in the... Uh, valley just below Gibeon. And that night the Lord said, get up, go down into the Midianite camp, for I have given you the victory over them. But if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your assistant Pura and listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you will be greatly encouraged. And Gideon said, no, I'm not scared at all. I'll just stay here. No, that's not what happened at all. It says, then you'll be eager to attack. And it says, so Gideon took Pura and went down to the edge of the enemy camp. Because why? Because he's obviously a little nervous about this battle. It says, the army is of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east. Notice there's more, more enemies than ever. We started out with the people of Midian. Now it's other people as well. Had settled in the valley like a swarm of locusts. And their camels were like grains of sand, 
on the seashore, too many to count. It says Gideon crept up just as a man was telling his companion about a dream. So they're overhearing this. And the man said, I had this dream, and in my dream, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. And it hit a tent, and it turned it over and knocked it flat. He'd been probably watching too much British baking snow. I had that same dream. It was a barley loaf, and then it tumbled down on the house, and then Paul cut it in half, is the thing. Anyway, so his companion answered, your dream can only mean one thing. God has given Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite, victory over Midian and all its allies. They were scared of Gideon. They were, it's like God gave him an an opportunity to go, they're scared of you. And when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship before the Lord. And he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, get up, for the Lord has given you victory over the Midianite hordes. Like, man, isn't that amazing? Like, God knew that Gideon <laughs> was afraid. And I love this about this story because once you start thinking, oh, Gideon's just a pawn, God's just moving Gideon around like a a piece on a chessboard or like a little army man in a simulation, not really. Because God cares enough about Gideon to go, I know you're afraid, and I know what I'm doing looks crazy, but you got to trust me, and here's the thing. I've already prepared this. Like, And so just the fact he let Gideon see that is just so amazing. And it's so interesting to think that God in his, like, mercy and love for us and for Gideon, like, he calls us to be brave. He he does, and he calls us to do crazy things at times. Like, I can't think of anything crazier than going, okay, I'm going to be the guy who says, I think we should fight. And then a giant, for them at least, army shows up, and then you send most of them home, and then God gets rid of the rest of them. And then you look around the room, and it's like, I've got, like, 300 against 30,000 maybe, 50,000, 100, who knows? Now, here's where I love this story. Because I think this is such a picture of the way God works. This is such a picture of the the way God works because none of the things they were planning for sort of mattered because God had his own plan that nobody could have imagined. And that's what I, I think of nothing else like about where our world is at right now. Like, we should get an idea of this being true. Because guess what? Six months ago, like at Christmas, you and I thought we knew how things would work, right? Like, we had a pretty good idea in January, like, how our future would look. And I'm not saying, like, oh, God sent the virus. God allowed the virus. And I'm not also going, oh, it's a good thing. I hate when people say that. Oh, it's a good thing. Well, it might be a good thing for you. Probably not a good thing for everybody. But we also have to be sort of wise enough to go, oh, but we can learn things even from the worst thing. And so so I think this is such a perfect picture, even in our lives, to go, guess what? Can you imagine anything five months ago more powerful than the mouse? I mean, Mickey Mouse. Like, if you think about Disney, was the most powerful thing on earth. Like, they had, uh, you know, they've got all these amusement parks open. They own... ESPN, like they have sports. They had five, no, six movies that grossed over a billion dollars. They have the Avengers. They have Star Wars. They're ruining it, and they have it. Like they have Star Wars, and they buy it, and then just like remodel it into like a crappy house. Like they could do anything they want. Like that was just personal. But like Star, they they have everything. Like there was nothing, and they just had bajillions of dollars. They're, They're literally swimming in cash like Scrooge McDuck. And you and I, four months ago, couldn't have thought of a thing that could have happened. Like, what, are people going to stop watching Avengers movies? That Disney Plus had just come out. Now they have Disney Plus and they're borrowing money. And I don't say that because I'm happy about that. I don't say that I go, oh, look at Disney. I'm saying that because you and I could not have pictured a scenario where that could have happened. And while we were thinking that, there was a tiny little virus happening in China that would change that. And we didn't know. And that's the way life is. And so sort of every contingency, it it just just should remind us like how little we know of what the future is going to be. And that's the same thing here. Like everything they had planned for, like, okay, if I call an army, will they come? Yes, they came. 22,000 guys, this is amazing. Then God says, okay, some of those are scared. Send them home. You go 10,000. Okay, these are the bravest guys in Israel. We'll go out there. We've got it together. We've got maybe, maybe because we're braver, we'll win. And then God sends 300 
home, and then he's like, I don't know, like, you know, I can just imagine Gideon going through these scenarios in his mind going, I don't know, maybe we have superpowers. We're <laughs> probably like, I don't know, jumping. You're like, going, maybe, you know, trying to figure out how it is that they're going to defeat all these 30,000 people, whatever. They're like, maybe, like, we can't be killed. Here, stab me. You know, like, they're doing all these things, trying to figure out how it's going to work. And then special weapons and tactics. Like, think about what happens. It says he divided the 300 men into three groups, so 100 each. And he gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. And so once again, Gideon is using some strategy, which is also interesting. It doesn't mean just because we're serving God and just because we're following him that we're mindless robots because Gideon, it doesn't say God told him this. It literally just says Gideon did this. So this is probably Gideon's idea. Then he said, keep your eyes on me. And when I come to the edge of the camp, do just as I do. And as soon as I and those with me blow their ram's horns, blow your horns too. <laughs> I keep thinking about pickup trucks. I'm sorry. I'm just so dumb. All around the entire camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. And it was just after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp. And suddenly they blew the ram's horns and they blo broke their clay jars. And all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars. Now, this is so interesting to me because this is Gideon's strategy. It doesn't say God said to do it. But not every one of those guys would have had a ram's horn. That wasn't like, that would be something you do to lead a company of, of soldiers. So I was reading about this and it, it's so interesting to think about like, Basically, the 22,000 guys that came and then the 10,000 guys that came and then all of them, they brought the clay pots and the, they, they brought something. They literally, they wouldn't have each had a ram's horn and each had a clay pot and a torch. Like, they brought the equipment. So all of those guys were actually important, it turned out, but not in the way anyone could have pictured. It was basically, he could have said, like, let's have a GoFundMe and raise money for clay pots and torches. Like, that's really what he needed, but he had 22,000. It's so interesting because what happens next? So then they held the blazing torches in their left hands and the horns in their right hands, and they all shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And each man stood at his position around the camp and watched. That is not what anybody thought. Like, they're thinking, like, how am I going to defeat this army? And they did it with surprise, and they did it with tactics, and they did it with really, you know, sort of mental warfare that they were already, God had already made everyone so afraid. And it literally says they stood there and they watched as all the Midianites rushed around in panic, shouting as they ran to escape. And when the 300 Israelites blew their ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. And those who were not killed fled to places as far as way as Beth, Shitta, is full, Clark, near Zera, and to the border of, that's the way you pronounce it, it's in the Bible, uh, to the border of Abmethala, I can't pronounce that either, and Taba. So, Amazing, like God prepares this path where they can sit and watch the guys kill each other. Now, next week I'm going to talk about something that's kind of interesting because you get the idea from that, like, and the rest of the story is important because it doesn't get any better than that. Like, just seeing how God planned this thing and scattered everyone, that's amazing. But you and I can get the idea, oh, okay. And it sort of could turn us into activists, you know, like keyboard warriors where we go, if I just raise the, you know, if I just have the idea and I just am brave and I go, hey, we should do this. And we see a lot of that in our world. Like, hey, I'm going to start a GoFundMe. Yes, that can be helpful, but that's not it. Because Gideon, I'm just going to tell you this in advance, Gideon didn't get a chance just to sit there and watch everyone kill each other and then he had to do nothing. That's not what happened. Like the rest of this is a battle. It's a slog. And you should know that about life. Like, just because you're brave and just because you stand up and just because, like, God is with you, it doesn't mean things are going to be easy at the end. Um, there's, still, there's still a battle to go. So that's next week. But I want you to think about this part. Because for all of our thoughts and talk about, like, oh, what was Gideon's place in this? Like, why does God call someone like Gideon and sort of put him through this and sort of make him be brave and encourage him to be brave and then his bravery is contagious and all these other guys came forward and then 
truthfully, when you read this, you just kind of go, God could have done this all himself. Like, why does he even need man? And that's a question that's been through the ages. Like, you know, 1,600 years ago, there was like some sort of monk sitting in a cave contemplating this question because it's difficult. Like, what is my place in this world? What do I need to do? If God can do everything, why does he need me? But yet it seems that throughout history, God calls men and women to do brave things, to lead others, to do these things. And But I, I want to just point to you, and I, this stuck out on the page, and I've never thought about this before until this week. But what did they shout? I love this. I love this. They shouted for the Lord and for Gideon. And honestly, wasn't just for Gideon. Let's not forget something. Like you can go, well, God was using Gideon as a pawn. Yeah, sort of. Sort of like moving him around like the hat on the Monopoly board. God could have done this all himself. But notice, why was he doing it? He wasn't doing it for God. God doesn't need this done. God is doing it for them, for the Lord and for Gideon. Like he's going, if you will trust me, if you will be brave, if you will be obedient, I'm going to do something amazing for you, not for me. For the Lord. And for Gideon, I was thinking about that, like my urge to you. Um, I want to urge you to be brave. I think the people that we have today and the people that are out there on the live stream, and it's growing. I'm so glad you guys are tuning in and watching during the week. In fact, sort of my vision for Action Church, we were talking about this, is that we will gather... Um, but never again will you miss a service. Like, it doesn't mean you'll be here every week, but, like, you'll never sort of miss a part of the service. You'll never be behind because we're going to find ways, and we're already working on it. And I'm excited about where we can communicate better and be a body, whether we're inside or outside of this building, and we'll come back together in this building in larger numbers, and we'll stay connected even when we're gone. And so that's my prayer for you is that you put your name in there. Like, that God would raise up brave people here at Action Church. And we would kind of go, for the Lord and for Bob. You know, I put your name in there. Not Bob, I just picked a name because there wasn't anyone in there that would think that they had to be Gideon. But like, but for the Lord and for Steve. You know, for the Lord and for. Because that's what God wants to do still today. That's the whole purpose of him calling brave people. If you look throughout history, throughout the Bible, it's like he calls brave people. He, yes, he does. You're never going to get, and I know I, people say this all the time to each other. I, this is, I'm tired of COVID commercials, and I'm tired of stay safe. And, and if you've said that to me, that's okay. I get it. Like, you want to be nice, but, like, stay safe. Like, that's no way to live. Like, and I know we need to be smart, and we have to take care of ourselves, and I don't want to get COVID either, and I don't want to spread that to anyone else. But the whole idea of staying safe is a dangerous idea because that's not what God, God says. No, be brave. Get brave. But he never does it. So sort of like, and then you'll get rich Gideon, even though Gideon got very rich and famous and somehow had 800 sons and 73 wives. It was crazy. It was all crazy up in Gideon's house after this. But that was not the purpose. What they shouted was true for the Lord, like the Lord. This is for the Lord. We're doing something amazing for the Lord. But they said for Gideon, but it was really for Gideon and everybody around Gideon. Like, the way this story ended is the way we started this series, and we've got one more week. I'm so glad of that. Is it started saying that after this battle, and the little part of the battle we're going to see next week, no one even, it doesn't say, and then they win every battle out of that. It doesn't say that. It says no one attacks Israel again as long as Gideon's alive, even when he's like 82 years old and like doesn't even know where he's at. They're like, not as long as Gideon's alive. We are not chancing that. So this was for the Lord, for Gideon, and everybody around him. And that's my prayer for you. You and what army? What are you going to do? What is God calling you to do that's brave? And yeah, it's for God. And yeah, we're really sort of, if we're Christians, sort of pawns. 
But oh my goodness, the strategist, the chess master who's moving us around. He doesn't do it to bring him glory as much as to do amazing things for us. And through that, we give him the glory. So I want to pray with you and I want to pray for you. Um, and I can't wait to see the brave things you do because it's not just about you. Like you're going, oh, I don't know, I'm not, that's not for me. I get it, I get it. But you have no idea like what God could do for your community, for your family, for your future if you're obedient and brave. Dear God, we are so, so grateful. I'm grateful for this story. It's such a great story. It gives us hope not only that you're in charge. And we look around and we go, we don't understand what's going on. But one thing that's never changed is that you've been in control. And so that gives us hope. But God, I'm really drawn to the fact that you're so kind to Gideon and that you reassure him. And then I'm also encouraged by the fact that Gideon was often afraid. And God, I just admit to you that we're afraid. We, we, we don't know what the right thing is to do most of the time. God, we're not the smartest. We're not the best. We're not the most powerful. We're not the most connected. But God, I pray that you would give us strength, that we would be the bravest and the most obedient. And God, that I pray that through that, like amazing things would come out of this group of people. And we'll give you the credit and say for the Lord and for everyone around us. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, make you laugh when the pain no, they won't leave your side. No, they won't retreat. Brother, please don't give up. Your life 
is found in the family made will always say you'll find your strength in the bonds we made in the steps There's a place with eyes together Days are changing But there's more to a place with us together.